what happens also in the course of the 20th century is the development of cities, is the growth of urban settlements, which I just want to say about now. So say something about firstly, uh, before moving um, on. Um, what happens with the coming of the colonial rulers is they create new settlements um, where there were, where there were uh, existing settlements, villages, uh, they often decided um, we want to locate our capital here, the, in Mali for instance, in Bamako, or um, in Senegal, in Dakar, um, where there was just a small settlement. And these became their main uh, posts for administering their territories. Many of these cities uh, were only established um, by the, the colonial forces or they grew into massive cities um, under colonialism. And um, as these cities grew um, because of commerce, uh, of administration, there was, you also find that um, and schools established um, in, these, um, in these cities, the beginnings of an educated elite. The edu African educated elite is associated with the growth of settlements and cities um, and the mission schools. The mission schools particularly in uh, the British colonies. In the French colonies less so but also there. And these educated men because in the beginning it was largely men, they become the basis for the first organizations that start to challenge, that start to ad address the, um, the colonial state, asking not again, um, making, not making radical demands, but making yeah. very um, reformist uh, in, uh, requests uh, for improvement in the status of the black uh, black man. So, for instance, the organisations you have these organisations um, in again around this time, 1912. Bloemfontein. <coughs> Do you know that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Bloemfontein. You have that um, similar organizations established elsewhere. Um, 1919. Do you know the ICU? Intensive care unit. <laughs> what does the ICU stand for? <laughs> Industrial and Commercial Workers Unit. Union. Okay. That was the biggest union in South Africa. Huh? Industrial and Commercial. It was... Okay. Okay. So, um, you find you found around that time um, a growth of these organisations that uh, stem basically from w that has a connection with the growth of cities and people who were articulate in the dominant language of the colon of the colonial power in South Africa. It's English um, in. Uh, uh, in Senegal and in West Africa, it is French. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to, um, firstly, let me, yeah, the, the, this period here, you also have a number of developments globally during this period. 1970. What is that? 
the Russian Revolution. Okay. And so the ideas around revolution, um, the ideas around communism and Marxism and so on, were also spreading amongst this elite. This elite um, was largely a, a mission educated elite, largely influenced with liberal ideas, um, but a small section um, would come into contact with Europeans who were socialists, who had come to work on the railways, for instance. In the Sudan, the origins of communism begin with, with British uh, 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 workers and engineers who came to the Sudan to work on the railways. And they spread these ideas. Uh, and they spread these ideas amongst Sudanese workers and intellectuals and they started becoming used to such uh, language and began to make certain demands cast in that language that was shaped by socialism and so on. In South Africa also, uh, but that's another story with the or origins of the Communist Party which was largely limited to the white population and white workers so that in fact the demand in a big strike in 1922 is that is that the workers of the world but unite but white workers of the world unite okay so there were all these contradictions here 1922 but this is what basically i'm trying to show you it's a big shift from the resistance that was defensive because now you find the growth of a working class um, and then these intellectuals, people like uh, associated with the ANC, Sol Plyke, uh, Pixlika Seme, all these names. Seme was a, a, a big intellectual who won the prize at Columbia University in New York for the best speech of around 1910 thereabouts. The best speech out of the whole university, yeah. Pixlika Seme. And his talk, you know what is his talk called? His talk was called The Renaissance of Africa. You should read that speech because Mbeki picks that up basically. Mbeki picks up, I can, I have a, you can get a copy if you want, I can yeah. bring you that speech. But Sam is already using that, those ideas, that pan-African ideas. He's talking about Abyssinia and the great civilizations. It's all still vague to him, you know, but he's, he's, he's got a sense that we must speak about Africa as a great continent. You see, he's getting out of his idea that he's from a particular tribe and he must just protect his little space. He's got big ideas and it's often because of traveling, of meeting other Africans, of meeting people from the Caribbean, meeting African Americans. So this is a crucial idea, uh, period. Um, and it coincides with the construction of the colonial state as the colonial state uh, implements uh, its, 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 its um, lines of authority, its institutions. They are also pressures from these. So that in South Africa, for instance, um, when uh, the union is formed in 1910, um, the, the, the union of South Africa, um, in the in the in, in the in the run up to the union, these intellectuals would come to establish the the South African National Native Congress, and others, uh, they go to London and they make representations and they ask that uh, the the black man be included and get the vote and and that kind of thing. And they go and they praise the queen. It, you know the the this period the. The ANC, the, these intellectuals, and for a long time, until about the time of Mandela, the ANC is very much a liberal organization. <laughs> uh, very much. You know, it's only with the, with the Youth League and the radicalization of the, 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 the mainstream organization was, was quite conservative. That history is important to remember because there's that liberal element. And in this period, they also rely a lot on using certain white figures as intermediaries. Um, 
as their representatives. Um, um, there's one particular person whose name I forget now, who, who is, and these white uh, 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 figures, uh, especially in the Cape, um, because the Cape was more liberal, they were seen as, they called themselves the friends of the natives. Okay, <laughs> the friends of the natives. That is the liberal tradition here in the Cape, the liberal tradition of the friends of the natives. In any case, the, they believed that there was some way in which educated black men, and it was men only, um, could make the case that uh, 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 for equality, uh, and that they would be the models with their good English, with their knowledge of Shakespeare and the knowledge of the Bible. Sol Plaike translated Shakespeare into, into Tswana. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, this, it was a, a version of assimilationism. So there was this idea that you assimilation, it's just a big word which you can uh, to assimilate, to become like, uh, um, like, you know. This idea of assimilationism was very strong in the French colonies, where if you spoke French well, and if you um, uh, could behave like a French person, you could become a citizen. Okay? So in the French colonies, you actually had a handful of black Africans who became citizens, full citizens, and they went into the parliament, in, in, into the National Assembly in Paris. So there was a version of this kind of assimilationism in the British colonies also. Uh, and they thought through speaking the language of the colonizer, of the colonial state, of the colonial um, rulers, we could get concessions. So it was very conservative. Um, we could get concessions. But again, it was a, a handful, and it was in the cities.